Okay, Chair, we are now live on Facebook if you want to convene the meeting. Great. It is uh, seven o'clock on December 8th. I'm going to call this Transportation Policy Board meeting to order. And let's start with some introductions and roll call. Yeah. Yeah. Um, City of Olympia. Good morning, everybody. Danny Madrone with the Olympia City Council. Our Chair, City of Lacey. Andy Ryder. City of Tumwater. Hi, uh, this is uh, Mayor Pete Kavat. Thurston County. Good morning, everyone. Carolina Mejia, Thurston County Commissioner. City of Rainier. Good morning, everyone. Ron Kemp, City of Rainier. City of Tonino. Good morning, everybody. John O'Callaghan representing the great city of Tonino. City of Yelm. I'm not seeing our rep joining us yet. If he joins us, we can jump back to him. North Thurston Public Schools. Maddox, Director of Transportation, North Thurston Public Schools. Inner City Transit. Uh, Don Mountain, Authority Member. Good morning, everybody. Our State Government Rep. Kevin Dragon uh, with the Department of Enterprise Services. Good morning. And then our representatives from WashDOT. Uh, John Winans, uh, Washington State DOT Olympic Region Administrator. And I think I saw this is here. I thought I saw him too, but maybe he jumped out. Yeah, Gaius is here. He's a Gaius Sinoy, also from the Olympic regions here. Okay. Um, business rep, one of our business rep. Renee Radcliffe Sinclair, business rep. And then our first community rep, Graham. I am. Yeah, looks like she's frozen. Okay, so Graham Sackerson is our community rep, and then our other community rep, Kevin. Kevin Fessinger, community rep. Thank you. And uh, let's do. Do you have an executive executive director's report, Mark? Well, um, first, Sherry, if I, I'll run through staff, if if oh, uh, you would like. Please. Okay. Um, inner city transit, we have Rob LaFontaine from um, Washdot mentioned. We also have Guy Snoy from Olympia, um, Sophie Stimson from Tumwater, Mary Heather Ames from Thurston County, Matt Unzelman, and from TRPC, you have um, me, Mark Daly, um, Karen Parkhurst, Vina Tabbitt, Dave Reed, Berlina Lucas, Paul Brewster, and Theresa Julius. Eight. I believe now that we'll is that. everyone. Now we'll do that. Uh, yeah, just a, a couple of things. We're um, and we'll we'll be uh, talking uh, talking about this um, more. But we're kicking off the recruitment of the business and community representatives, and so um, when that goes out, please help us get the word out so we can get lots of folks interested in both the community reps and the the business rep positions. Um, just so TPB knows, um, this next month, January is one of those months that, that um, the first Friday falls on uh, a different kind of day. So council is on January 14th instead of the, the normal first Friday. So just, just so we know, it's one of those, one of those months where um, the, the two meetings get a little bit off. And uh, one thing I wanted to share really briefly was we've got our um, one page for the legislative session. Are you seeing which? Are, are you seeing more than team meetings, or are you seeing uh, my presentation screen? I see, I see your presentation. presentation. Good. There. Okay, there is the ledge priority. So this is the handout that we're going to be using this legislative session as we go meet with folks. Um, we've kept it to one page front side, which we're pretty happy with. Thank you everyone for really helping us focus in on transportation with the, the key point being I-5. Also the, the completing the Yelm bypass loop and the, the roundabouts on 507 outside of Yelm, uh, as well as the TDM strategies. And then for broadband, the focus is, is really on 
Uh, there's a lot of funding coming our way in terms of broadband, um, not a whole lot of funding or there isn't funding for coordination of that work under the, the broadband action team that, that counties have been asked to form. And so we're looking for some help from the state to, to get some better coordination going on as these broadband dollars are, are, are going out. So, so, so those what, are our priorities. So what yeah. specifically will that ask be then for broadband? Is it for the... For TRP, for additional dollars for coordination, or is it the, for the main? It, it, there isn't really because we've been talking about this with with the county and with others. There isn't a specific dollar figure that's uh, been identified because there, in, in the infrastructure package and other areas, there are there are lot dollars that are out there. Yeah. The main point is that right now there isn't any. Um, funding for coordinating this work. And yet some of the grant sources are requiring um, uh, endorsement by a broadband action team. But we're just standing up a broadband action team right now with people ar around the region, you know, other duties as assigned. Um, as this keep ramps up, there's going to be more work for that broadband action team. And we, and the, the the state, we're asking the state to make sure that there, there's funding to coordinate that work. So we're using those funds efficiently and effectively. Yeah, and it, it does make sense that the MPOs are the lead on <laughs> on coordination. It just, it just makes sense. They're already formed and, and ready to go. So um, yeah, the I, county's taking the lead on on ours. So we're we're in support of, really? of Thurston County. Uh, yeah, Jenica Machado is is kind of the lead on our broadband action team, and she's doing a good job uh, on that. So I, I feel like we've got a good setup. We just we just need a little a little more support from the state in terms of what are we trying to do as a broadband action team? What does it mean to approve um, and endorse different proposals? It's, it's just, it's a little murky right now and everyone's kind of fumbling their way through. So it would be helpful to get some, some direction from the state. Uh, uh, oh. yeah. uh, Pete, you're on mute. Yeah, yeah just, a, just a comment, not on that, but on the, on the I-5 part of this. Uh, I understand the focus on the Nisqually crossing. I think that's a good place to start, but I hope our messaging continues to be that there's the rest of the corridor that needs to be addressed. Um, I'm concerned that legislature will go, well, we funded that. Why are we we're, you know, why are we doing the rest of this? And and so I think I think we need to to say this is just the first piece of a, a, a bigger project. So I hope you can trying uh and it looks like your materials do talk about it sort of in that context so i just because i'm concerned that you know we we have huge we have huge issues with congestion at you know i-5 101 and some of the overpasses in tumwater and, and of course olympia as well so uh, anyway just thought i'd make that point point. and there, there's so many people talking about i-5 right now it's, it's, you know it's trpc it's the the chamber, it's the cities, it's uh, the South Sound Military Community Partnership. So I think we're all pushing in the same direction and the, the, it's loud and clear. Um, what's interesting is, is what kind of a transportation package if any is gonna come out or will there, the tweaks that they're, I guess we can talk about this later <laughs> in the meeting, but oh, is there anything else? No, um, no, that's it, Chair, thank you. Okay, um, with that, can I get a motion to approve today's agenda? Approval. Second. Move and second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of that motion signify by saying aye. 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 Is there anyone opposed? And that motion unanimously carries. Uh, next up is the approval meeting, approval of the meeting notes from November 10th. And if you could Move say approval. your names when you um, make your John motions, Callahan. that would help. Thanks. John, John Callen, motion. Is there a second? Don second. And Don second. Here. Okay. Uh, got that. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of that motion signify by saying aye. 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 Is there anyone opposed? And that motion now carries as well. Um, now it's up to uh, our public comment period. And we do have one person who signed up for public comment. Uh, Vina, can you bring that person in? Chair, I'm not seeing that she's in our meeting, so. Okay. Um, well, if she does 
come in, I, I would uh, take a few seconds and let, let her speak because we don't have a lot of public comment and I'd love to hear from the public if we get the chance. So uh, let's just keep that in mind if you see her pop up. Um, then our next agenda item is the Fruit Sound Regional Council's Transportation Policy Board member appointment. So uh, uh, go ahead, go ahead, Karen. Okay, thank you. Um, so as you'll remember, Doug DeForest, who left our August board, um, served as the representative to the Puget Sound Regional Council and their Transportation Policy Board. And this is a reciprocal agreement that we have with them and a recognition that transportation not only doesn't stop at our um, city boundaries and town boundaries, but it doesn't stop at the county boundaries either. So at the last meeting, we had a discussion about this and um, I noted that uh, member Madrone and Magia had volunteered uh, to be the representative and the alternate. Um, they sort of corrected me a little bit in saying that maybe volunteer was too strong a word. So anyway, <laughs> we didn't take action on it. And so today, uh, we would want to make sure that we hear from both of those people to see if they are still interested, take nominations from the floor uh, for others who might be interested and then have the board vote on this. Uh, Danny, you, are you still interested in being the representative? Sure, I can formally volunteer uh, <laughs> to do that starting in January because there is a meeting tomorrow and I already have something planned. <laughs> um, yeah. I'll also just, in the, the meeting summary, it does say that the meetings are from nine to noon, but it does look like they're from 930 to 1130. So I just want to make sure we're on the same same page with that, that you don't have some information I don't have. <laughs> no, that sounds right. Uh, and Carolina, are you, are you uh, okay? Yes, I'm happy to continue being the backup for it. Um, just with Great. my schedule, I just don't think I could be the primary. Sure, understandable. Is there uh, anyone from the floor who's interested in being the representative? So I don't see anyone. So I would move that we appoint um, Danny and as the primary and Carolina as the backup to the Puget Sound Regional Council's Transportation Policy Board. Second. second. Second, John O'Callaghan. Second from John. Is there any discussion? Oh, I just had a quick question. Um, who's going to be the, uh, the other representative from TRPC to the land use policy board up there? We, <clears throat> Chair, we're doing that at uh, their January meeting, so we don't have that selected yet. At okay. council. Yes. At, at council, yeah. Because th there's, there's two meetings that go on up there. There's the transportation side, which is, I think it's always kind of the more interesting side <laughs> of, of it. And then there's the, um, all, their, all their land use goes through Puget Sound Regional Planning Councils. Uh, so that, that's interesting too, but it's not quite, quite as relevant. But um, anyway, is there any other discussion? Seeing none, it's been moved and seconded for, to, for these appointments. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Is there anyone opposed? And that motion actually carries. Thank you to both of you for stepping up. So next is the trail plan update. Good morning, Transportation Policy Board. Um, we're gonna shift our focus now from I-5 and talk about trails. And I'm looking out my office window and I can see that there's twilight. The sun is rising. So I'd just like you all to imagine for a moment um, that it's a sunny day and you're out on the trail because there's really no better way than after having your cup of coffee or chai latte or tea or a glass of orange juice of getting out on the trail for a walk, bike ride, run, or walking the dog and getting invigorated. So put yourself in that frame of mind as I present to you um, work that's being done for a Southwest Thurston County Trail Feasibility Study and giving you an overview of um, the objectives and to what we're gonna include in the Thurston Regional Trails Plan update. So I wanna start off with um, an overview of the Southwest Thurston County Trail Feasibility Study because it's, it's a good example um, for what a feasibility study encompasses, especially one with public involvement. 
And the outcome of this study will inform updates to both the regional trails plan and the regional transportation plan. In 2018, um, the policy board recommended and TRPC awarded Thurston County a $150,000 surface transportation block grant to perform this study. And this funding was just obligated early this year and the project was kicked off this summer. So Thurston County is the project sponsor. Um, it has public works, um, public health and social services, community planning, economic development represented on the planning team. And the county is partnering with TRPC to manage the project and lead the community engagement process. And Katrina Van Every and I are the project leads. And SCJ Alliance is our project's technical consultant team. And they bring their planning and engineering expertise to this study. And Matt Unzelman, who's in this meeting, is, is part of this study. So if there's any specific questions um, about the county's role, I may defer to Matt to respond to that. So the idea for this trail in Southwest Thurston County was first introduced in the 2007 Regional Trails Plan. The concept for this trail was proposed by Rochester community members from their desire to create a safer walking and biking route for students to travel to school. So these students could avoid walking on the shoulder of US 12. There was also a need to connect the Chehalis Reservation, Rochester and Grand Mount communities um, to the future Gate Belmore Trail Corridor which was that right of way was acquired by Thurston County in 1996 with the TRPC grant and still remains undeveloped. So this regional trails plan in 2007 proposed what was known as the Gate Rochester Grand Mound Trail Route. It was proposed to run parallel to the Puget Sound and Pacific Railroad. And, and by the way, the Puget Sound and Pacific Railroad Roadmaster was involved in the regional trails planning process. And at that time was supportive of this trail concept within the railroad right of way. So since the plan was adopted in 2007, there was really not much further action on this trail concept until the Main Street Rochester strategy project began. And this project brought renewed interest to make Rochester a more bicycle and pedestrian friendly area. Following frontage improvements, support for a shared use trail was the second highest priority action identified in the 2018 community survey that was part of this project. The Main Street Rochester strategy recommends that consideration should be given to establishing a trail hub at the community park and connecting to the Plan Gate Belmore Trail. So existing trails in Thurston County region support a variety of activities. As I mentioned earlier, you know, walking, running, bicycling, could be wildlife viewing, photography, or, or just unwinding from stress. Um, needless to say, the Grand Mound, Rochester, and Chalice Reservation communities would directly benefit from a trail that would connect their communities. And taking a look at our existing network, this slide shows those existing trails in green and future trails or expansion of existing corridors in red. The red segments you see on this map are the corridors that have undergone a feasibility study or one is underway. There are approximately 58 miles of existing publicly managed multi-use trails in Thurston County. The three major paved trails are, the first is the 22 mile Chehalis Western Trail. And in fact, it's listed as one of the top 10 trails in Washington state by the National Rails to Trails Conservancy. Second is the 14 mile Yelm Rainier Tonino Trail. And both of these trails are owned and operated by Thurston County. And the third trail is the Karen Fraser Woodland Trail, individually owned and managed separately by Lacey and Olympia. Tumwater's Deschutes Valley Trail is the newest addition to the network, stretching from Brewery Park to Tumwater Historic Park. And then there's other shorter segments like the Ralph Monroe Trail and a portion of the SR 510 alternate path through Yelm. The feasibility studies completed the Olympia Karen Fraser Woodland Trail phase three and four feasibility studies, the Elm Rainier extension feasibility study, the Gate Belmore Trail connectivity study, the West Bay Park Recreation Trail and Restoration Analysis, the Tumwater Deschutes Valley Trail study and design, and the Elm Prairie Line Trail extension to Roy. Just about all of these trail corridors or a portion of, the, portion of their existence to TRPC's federal transportation grant programs. 
and the work that was performed with the Thurston Regional Trails Plan. So here's a closer view of the study area. So if you note on the Northwest, um, that upper left section of the slide, you can see the Southern terminus of the Gate Belmore Trail where it enters the planning area. And just to the Southwest is an existing multi-use path along Anderson Road that was developed by the Chehalis Reservation. And to the East, you can see a proposed trail corridor that was identified as part of the Grand Mountain Transportation Study. This study will account for these trails and explore connections to them. So I'd, I'd kind of like to give you um, just a little trail planning process overview or 101 in the context of this Southwest Thurston County study. This study takes a, a detailed and systematic look at trail opportunities that were beyond the scope of previous planning efforts. This study kind of combines the elements of both a master plan and feasibility and concept phases of trail planning. The regional trails plan was the first countywide plan to consider a trail connecting communities in this part of the county. The regional trails plan functions as a countywide trail master plan in this framework. The master plan process really takes ideas and starts to develop a conceptual trail or system. It identifies vision, expresses community values, and provides high level guidance for future actions. And the, the Southwest Thurston County Trail Study will engage communities to identify opportunities for routes and trail related facilities like trailheads. And it will evaluate the types of trail activities people want to pursue and evaluate the needs for active transportation routes. So the feasibility and concept stage is an investigative approach to define project objectives and potential outcomes. So over the course of this study, we will ask the public and stakeholders to consider multiple trail route scenarios within the planning area and evaluate the performance to meet their need. The study will also consider right of way and determine if property acquisition may be necessary. We will look at constraints such as developed areas, water resources, utilities, and other physical challenges. And community feedback will lay the groundwork for the criteria that will be used to measure how effective a trail route will perform to meet certain needs. Um, for instance, if parents, they may want a trail that connects to schools or parks so their children have a safe route to walk or bike. In such, in this case, a proposed trails, directness of route, its visibility from a security standpoint, and its separation from automobile traffic would be useful criteria for evaluating the trail safety characteristics and usefulness for younger trail users. So we anticipate that one or more routes may emerge as preferred options by the end of the study. The results will inform Thurston County's future trail planning activities, as well as updates to the regional trails plan. And so this feasibility study provides the preliminary research to inform a future design phase. So that's really where the scope of this study ends. Um, looking to the future, a design phase, engineers and planners perform more detailed assessments and prepare construction documentation to bring the project closer to shovel ready state. This could involve land surveys, stormwater analysis and design, geotechnical studies, traffic analysis, wildlife assessments and mitigation, you start to get the picture. And this design phase must satisfy all the local state and federal permitting requirements for a project. So prior to construction, the sponsor may need to secure right of way for a trail which would involve private property acquisition or obtaining easements within utilities. And in this case, perhaps even within a railroad right of way. And then there are a variety of construction documents such as drainage and erosion control design, demolition, grading, plan and profile specs, signing detour routes. Again, you get the picture, all of this must be complete before a project can go out to bid for construction. And the entire process for a trail from idea construction, as you can imagine, can take several years. And in some cases, it can be decades. So what are this study's objectives? Well, one, we wanna learn what the communities value about trails and their utility. We wanna identify and evaluate potential routes and trailheads and their ability to align with the community's interests. We need to estimate cost to construct potential trails and related infrastructure, whether it's trailheads, um, wayfinding sides, seating, and also consider long-term maintenance. 
then we need to figure out how we're going to implement it, how we're going to pay for it. So implementation strategies will look at some practical approaches to phasing projects. Some considerations for prioritizing sections of trail could involve evaluating where the greatest demand is anticipated on the network. Um, there may be some sections that are least complicated and lowest cost to construct, and this could help the county align the right project with the right grant. And future planning activities will benefit knowing where there is the greatest public support for the location and function of trail segments and the partnerships that will inform project phasing and decision making. So the project team wants to focus our initial public outreach on the communities within the planning areas. Both the Main Street Rochester and Grand Mountain transportation studies that were performed pre-COVID taught us that Southwest Thurston County residents will show up to public meetings if they're in their communities if invited. Early in the summer, we were optimistic that with COVID vaccination efforts and the decline in transmission rates would allow us to meet with the public in person. But by August, we realized this was not possible and we plan to convene our first public meeting online. So in preparation, we mailed 6,700 postcard invitations to households in the study area while simultaneously conducting a social media campaign. We installed some large vinyl banners and locations throughout the community and we sent email invitations to distribution lists that were created from previous studies. The first public meeting for the project was held online on the evening of November 4th. And while 56 non-staff registrants signed up to participate in the meeting, which would really be a strong showing for an online meeting, only 20 representatives actually attended, but they represented their interests well. Um, we launched an online open house in late October to coincide with the arrival of postcards in the mailbox. And the open house consists of three tabs. This, this, first, this slide here shows the first of the three and it's an introduction about the project. The second tab is an interactive mapping tool that allows participants to draw routes, points and add comments. And before Thanksgiving weekend, we had about 40 comments submitted through the online map. While we haven't examined this feedback in detail yet, um, preliminary observations of the feedback reveal that there is interest in locating a trail corridor, but, but away from US 12 and the Puget Sound and Pacific Railroad. So people really want to see a trail get away from, from traffic. The third tab is a survey. It consists of 12 questions about how and why people use or may use trails, what characteristics are important to people in a route, the types of destinations the trails should connect to and what other trail related facilities should be considered as part of this study. It also includes seven demographic questions. Um, before Thanksgiving, we had less than 37 survey responses since the survey was launched. We reached out to the Chehalis tribe and staff and they shared an email with a link to our survey and we more than doubled our response rate in just a few days. We also reached out to some colleagues we know who live in the Rochester area and asked them to help post a link to our open house on the social media app next door. And so this open house is open till the end of the year and we plan to evaluate the results early next year. So as far as what the study will produce and its deliverables, there will be a current conditions report which will summarize existing plans, studies, technical information and that will inform opportunities and constraints within the planning area. Um, there will be this route needs assessment that will summarize the trail alignment scenarios um, and a perform um, an evaluation based on performance criteria. And the scenario evaluation will start to kind of tease out what the preferred routes are based on their performance and ranking cost estimates for construction and maintenance. Um, we'll develop an implementation strategy um, that will identify the leads, how projects will be funded, the partnerships, potential timelines and, and funding sources. And then a final report will wrap it up and bring all of these documents together. So that, that sort of concludes an overview of the Southwest Thurston County Trail Feasibility Study. And I would just suggest you hold off on the questions about that until I, I get through this next segment of the presentation. So I now wanna segue into um, the Thurston Regional Trails Plan update. It was first adopted in 2007. 
Um, it provides a regional blueprint to guide the development of a multi-use trail system to serve a variety of active transportation and recreational uses. The plan identifies 29 segments totaling around 145 miles, 87 of which remain undeveloped. And the plan most directly supports the regional transportation plans policy 11C, that is investing in a regional network of contiguous and connected north-south and east-west dedicated shared use trail corridors to serve as the backbone of the non-motorized system. And the regional trails plan provides a region for a regional trails network. And that vision is um, a network that is accessible, expandable, and effectively connected with on-street facilities to connect all the communities of Thurston County. The network will serve to provide safe and enjoyable non-motorized recreation and travel options for its users. So really one of the objectives of an updated plan is, is for TRPC and the policy board to really identify what will be your next big accomplishment with regional trails. Because there are numerous accomplishments that the regional trails plan achieved. Um, there were many that were not included in the plan, but certainly fulfill the plan's goals and policies. Um, just, just some example, the most recent, um, Thurston County completed um, linking the original alignment by tunneling under the BNSF mainline railroad. Um, TRPC funded and we developed a hub junction commemoration project. The city of Yelm um, was successful and recently being awarded a recreation conservation office, Washington wildlife recreation program grant to construct, continue constructing the Yelm Prairie line trail um, out to um, beyond the Yelm Canal across the Nisqually River. That project has just only received part of its funding request. Um, Thurston County acquired 1.4 miles of right of way on the north end of its Gate Belmore Trail to make that trail corridor connect with Kennedale Park. Um, City of Olympia completed some neighborhood connectors at Ensign Road Northeast and Fairview Street. And there was also a neighborhood connector um, from the Boys and Girls Club in Lacey at Tracy Street Southeast to the Woodland Trail. Um, perhaps TRPC's greatest contribution to the regional trail network is the Bridging the Gap project. And seven years after TRPC adopted the trails plan, the final bridge to close the gap over Pacific Avenue was completed and I know this is Mayor Komet's last TPB meeting as mayor of Tumwater, but it, it's worth repeating that Mayor Komet spearheaded the movement and TRPC's involvement for bridging the gap project. So his leadership really sets a high bar for TRPC. So what is the ne next major trail project the TPB will champion? So I'd like to kind of, um, put into context the regional trails plan and its role um, in, in the region. And so as staff, we are proposing um, some objectives and contents for the plan that I would like to present to you. And, and it includes a high level policy framework that will clarify the relationship of the trails plan to the regional transportation plan and local plans. So this framework will review consistency between local policies and the regional trails plan for development of that vision. The planning process will confirm the vision and assess the effectiveness of the existing trail plan goals and policies. It will provide a region-wide context for a core regional trail network showing the locations of trails and the needs they will provide and the populations they serve. The plan will be rich with maps that show alignments to help readers understand what, what destinations trails connect to and what populations they serve. And this will be done through maps that juxtapose the trails with demographic data, such as age, income, disability, and ethnicity. We'll have a state of the system assessment that will summarize accomplishments over the last 15 years, highlighting some trail success stories and the partnerships that made them happen it will present the existing network as of 2021, its utilization were known and describe the operations and maintenance conditions that would be presented based on the knowledge of trail managers 
and data where available. And this assessment will inform follow-up planning recommendations to guide the region and trail managers for interagency coordination for trail development operations and maintenance. It will include, we're proposing it includes a 10-year list of trail segments and projects that are most likely to proceed to a design right-of-way or construction phase, or maybe even a feasibility study based on that project's ability to satisfy any necessary technical studies, um, its anticipated or secure funding status, and the sponsoring agency's anticipated project programming and their readiness to proceed. This section will include project details such as alignments, project leads, phases, cost estimates, timelines, potential funding sources. And we anticipate presenting this information in easy to use map and narrative format that will be like the existing plan. We also propose to have a list of longer term planned or proposed trail segments that show potential to expand the network. These segments require studies to validate their feasibility or present various challenges, such as right of way acquisition. There, there are some real potential corridors um, for trails out there, but they still have active um, rail service on them. So we just, we just wanna keep them in our bank of, of ideas for future development. Now this list of trails would provide much less detail than the 10 year list. And then we would need recommendations for follow-up trail planning activities as the regional trails plan really is a master plan that provides that sort of higher level view. But it goes without saying that there needs to be coordination of effort um, for trail planning. So this, this list of recommendations um, can guide potential interagency coordination of maintenance operations um, helping to promote the trails through information, improving navigation, um, enhancing system safety and stewardship, addressing parking demand, and finding ways to collect data on trail utilization. And of course, we need a plan maintenance and update process that outlines when and how TRPC and the plan partners should review, amend, and update the plan. So we'll need an advisory work group um, that, that will sort of be the working body to advise and provide subject matter expertise in the planning process. The work group will weigh in on the policy framework to strengthen the plan's relationship to other plans. The work group will evaluate the state of the system and help shape recommendations for follow-up planning activities. They will evaluate the 10-year and longer-term project list and really provide some technical oversight and insight into that list and help inform the public engagement activities that shape the plan's recommendations. And, and they will help shape the plan maintenance and update process. So who will be on this advisory work group? Um, so it will be state and local agency transportation and park staff who plan, program, and manage multi-use trails. These are the trail practitioners. We also have people who are sort of the first line on the trails, park rangers, maintenance crews, maybe even have some um, occasional represent, representation with police and fire service representatives, those who are involved in response, safety, and security of trails. We know that beyond transportation, trails provide um, recreation, but also health and wellness, so having some public health representation. Um, some adult and youth demand man, transportation demand man, management specialists and managers, I can speak to the value of trails and serving um, commuting and community members or active trail users or proponents of active transportation and others who can lend voice to the needs of people who experience barriers to transportation. So I also want to talk about some of the transportation policy boards touch points in 2022. Um, in May staff, we, we hope to bring you a, a draft 10 year list of projects and how it could inform TRPC's federal transportation call for projects process in the future. In July, we hope that we'll give you a preview of the plan goals and policies and some of those draft recommendations for follow-up planning activities. And by October, the Transportation Policy Board will review the draft plan and public comments and consider a recommendation to TRPC. In terms of an overview of the major milestones in January, we hope to launch and convene the advisory work group for an introduction. 
and um, convene about six meetings from January through September. June will really be the big month for community engagement. We plan to op um, host an online public meeting, um, host an online open house that's similar to what I presented to you for the Southwest Thurston County Trail Feasibility Study. Um, we would include a survey on the project list and those follow-up planning recommendations. And we would conduct some weekend in-person outreach on the trails, do some boozing out on the trails. July would sort of be nose to the grindstone on putting the plan together and starting to develop it. So that in September, we're queuing it up for public comment. And then, like I mentioned in the previous slide, bringing it to you um, sometime around October, hopefully in October, perhaps November, but we'll try for October um, for you to review and forward a recommendation to the council for their action in November. So that's that really is a summary um, of the trails plan contents and we'll end it there and leave it open for your discussion and questions. Are there any questions at Don? Yeah, I just, I think in your memo, you talked about non-motorized vehicles on the trail. There's a much increasing preponderance of battery powered vehicles and some of them travel faster than other stuff. And I, I just wonder how you're gonna weave that into your, are the trails gonna remain quote non-motorized really because they really aren't now and just a planning suggestion that you consider how you're going to deal with that that's that's a great question don i think one it in that policy review we really need to consider um elect e-bikes and e-scooters you know it really i think the um thurston climate mitigation plan speaks to um the change that um micro mobility devices can bring to mobility in our community. And I, I think this trails plan is one of the steps where we can really walk the talk, so to speak, or use the e-bike with our talk because um, e-bikes, the technology is improving, the prices are coming down, they're attractive, especially attractive for people as they age, where it becomes more difficult to ride a bike longer distance. And e-devices really um, present an opportunity to increase people's mobility. Um, so I, I think the, the, the key is not to ban these devices from the trails, but to manage them. And, and one of the considerations that I think our trail managers need to take a serious look at is um, some type of operating speed on the trail to level the playing yeah. field. Thank you. Um, John? Uh, as far as that issue, if you call Virginia Beach, Virginia, they've already taken care of these, these same questions that you're asking right now about 10, 15 years ago when e-bikes really first started coming out and their, their unlimited speed at that time was around 35 miles an hour. Uh, so it'd be really good to get a hold of uh, Virginia Beach. Uh, the other part is I saw that you were looking for police and fire uh, participation in this group. Do you already have somebody for fire? And the reason I asked that is because I'm the chairman of Thurston County uh, Fire Commissioners. And if, if we can get you in front, we might be able to get you somebody to sit on that board. Thanks, John. I'll, I'll follow up with you on, on fire service representation. Um, I, and I just want to clarify, Washington State um, has uh, clarified through RCW that class one and class two e-bikes are permitted um, on bicycle facilities in Washington State. And the Cascade Bicycling Club also has some really good guidance on the use of e-bikes on, on shared use paths that we can look to. Is there anything else before I ask a couple questions? Let's... I see Mayor Komet has his hand up. Go ahead, Pete. Just a quick question. Um, so I appreciate the update and the schedule. I think uh, finally getting this back on schedule is, is important. So I'm really, really glad to see you moving ahead, Paul. Um, is that railroad out at, out at uh, the, the Grand Mound area, is that a very active railroad? Um, it's not a very active line. I mean, it's an active line, but infrequent use and low speeds. My understanding for that rail corridor to um, support um, more frequent and higher speed rail traffic would require upgrades to that corridor. But part of the study and 
part of the role of SCJ Alliance is to try to learn from Puget Sound and Pacific Railroad what what their long-term plans for that corridor are to about to be able to evaluate it as a potential trail corridor even if it's not part of this study maybe somewhere in the future it, it could be considered yeah i think the challenge out there as soon as you get away from an active uh already uh uh, uh constructed corridor like that is you start running into wetlands and go for habitat and all kinds of things that get really become challenges. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out over time. Uh, the, I've, I've often gone down, to, we often go down to the Chehalis to uh, Raymond, I forget the, the name of that. Uh, the Willapa trail. Hills. Willapa Hills. Hills Trail, what a spectacular ride that is. And I, I could easily see uh, this, this trail being very similar to that. So uh, good work, uh, look forward to seeing what what you come up with. Anyone else before I jump in? So I, I have a couple things. Um, one, I, I do think there is a, a really big need for us to start, you know, find a way to clean up our trails. Um, I, I rode the Karen Frazier Trail not too long ago. And, you know, it's, it's first of all, it's, it's kind of scary going down the trail now because there's there's, uh, you know, so there's a encampment off, off to the right when you, you know, get down and, you know, there's a, a lot of people using, using that trail and sort of just hanging out on that trail. And, um, you know, I, I see why some people would feel uncomfortable using it. And that's really unfortunate. I, and I do think that in some places, um, especially, you know, any time outside of summer, it starts getting dark and uh, it becomes an issue. And so some way that we could, you know, maybe have some, some lighting in some key parts would be really important. But what I'm coming at is we need to start thinking about the maintenance of our existing trails and how we're gonna fund that and who's gonna be responsible. And, and can we get some more community groups to help sort of you know, police the trails as well to help, you know, pick up garbage and all those other things you need to do. Because uh, that trail in particular, it's, the, the roots have gotten pretty bad and it is like, you know, <laughs> it's a jumpy uh, ride going down that trail now. And it's gotten significantly worse over the past, you know, three, four years. And so that, that really needs to be addressed, uh, how we do that. So that's number one, you know, the policing of the trails, the volunteer group, however we coordinate that. Um, the second thing, which we haven't really talked about in all of our I-5 discussions, is that the phase three and four of the Karen Fraser Woodland Trail, the fact that we don't connect Lacey, Olympia, and Tumwater right now with the trail is, is crazy, <laughs> especially when we're thinking about the, you know, billion dollars we're going to talk about improving this corridor if we don't include a bike path <laughs> along that corridor at the same time it, it will never happen and so but we haven't really talked about that as a part of the i5 um upgrades and i know it's going to be expensive but man that whole dang corridor is going to be expensive and so it would be really nice if we could start at least thinking about Let's not leave out that connection um, from Olympia to Tumwater um, in that, on, that, on that corridor. It would be really important that we maybe take a, another look at the phase three and four and, and, and try to include some of that in when we're talking about the, the improvement of I-5. Of I May as, <clears throat> yep. Chair, I, I want to speak to that. I'm really glad you brought this up because this is something that we've talked about internally and looked at the um, the Woodland Trail um, reports from, I think the most recent was either 2014 or 2016. Um, and the, the two pieces that are remaining to connect the Woodland Trail to, to now Tumwater Historic Park, there, there's kind of two segments both of them are rather expensive. They're right mm -hmm. along I-5. And we have internally been talking about the opportunity of when we look at 
um, uh, improvements to the I-5-101 interchange, wouldn't that also be a good time to look at the feasibility of connecting those two trail segments? Um, because in the, the, the context of, of that kind of a project, then they don't seem quite as expensive necessarily. So a very good point that uh, I, ho I, ho I hope we keep bringing up as this work progresses. Yeah, I think I think it's really important that we don't leave out that part. The other part that I, I've always come back to is at the the northern end of the Karen Fraser Woodland Trail. It sort of just ends out onto you know Martin Way, um, but what it really needs to do is connect over to the other side of the freeway and, and go down to what will be a future you know uh, town center of next to Cabela's that is finally starting to get some traction. On, on the Lacey side. I mean, that will be, you know, a, a future downtown type of area uh, for our community. And there's no trail connection to the rest of, you know, with uh, Olympia and, and Tumwater. And so we haven't even thought about the feasibility of, of how, what that looks like um, to get to the other side of the freeway. At some point, <laughs> you have to get the other side and, and continue that trail corridor down because that should be the, the natural conclusion of that area to connect Northeast Lacey to, to the rest of the communities. And, you know, they've been isolated out there for a long, long time. And part of it's because there's, there's no real trail corridor connecting the communities. And so I know we, that's even more work that we need to think about, but hopefully this is all something we can, you know, start wrapping our, our heads around and, um, and, and maybe thinking about in the future as we're talking about trails. Sounds like another feasibility study. It really, it really does. And it, the part, hard part is just getting across the freeway. Um, you know, once you're on the other side, it's pretty much a straight shot down. And so I, I don't think that will be too hard. It's just, uh, you know, how, how we get to the other side of the freeway. I, but I'll just conclude here by saying, I, I think the challenge with the regional trails plan is sort of clarifying the role between what what is the interest of the MPO versus what is the capacity of the local agencies who actually lead and sponsor these projects? Because you kind of hit the nail on the head, uh, Mayor Ryder, with um, expanding the Woodland Trail to the western shore of, of Capitol Lake and Tumwater. Mm -hmm. um, those two segments, the, the lead really is the city of Olympia, but it just phase four alone is nearly a $20 million project. Mm -hmm. um, unlikely to make the 10 year project list but yeah. if if it is the if it is the council's will to want to um, put some emphasis on that proposal this is an opportunity for the policy board and the council to kind of articulate how that project could move forward in a more expedited manner well you know trpc we've taken the lead <laughs> we've tried to take as much of the lead as possibly can on this on this i5 corridor and it, it makes sense that the npo is, is taking that lead. And like I said, if, if we don't include that part of, of this trail, it will never happen. It will never happen unless it's a part of this project because we're talking, you know, you, in the millions we know, and that's what's always stopped us in the past. It's like, we've done some feasibility, but it's, it's not gonna be, <laughs> it's not gonna be cheap trying to get down, down all the way down. So um, we have to figure this out in a bigger context of it. and. We're putting together a transportation package, include this corridor. This should definitely be included. And you're right, at this point, we should take the lead. So. Okay, well, thank you. Now, John? One last question. Uh, Paul, didn't you do a feasibility study about all the trails and how it connects uh, a few years ago with, with uh, bicycle riders? And uh, things like uh, maintenance and safety and restrooms and all that kind of stuff? It seems that you guys did something like that I a while back. Part of the trail plan. We did a survey. A, oh, it was a just survey? But we, it was just a survey? Yeah, we because, because I have to agree with, with the mayor is that uh, the safety part, you know, it, it doesn't sound like a whole lot and it doesn't sound like uh, it's a real uh, glamorous thing. But we've had the same complaints that uh, Andy's had about leaves, especially this time of year when the leaves are coming down and, and they just lay on, on the ground and it's wet and they get all slick. And we've been lucky, I think, so far where nobody's gotten really hurt. 
Uh, so they haven't sued us or anything, but it's going to happen, especially when the when the roads themselves start to degrade and and break apart. So maintenance needs to be and we've talked about this quite some time ago, uh, needs to be a major part of this, at least now, because these these uh, pathways are starting to degrade and we need to maintain them. And, and so I'll just close by saying that's why we're looking to have these recommendations for follow up trail planning activities, because this this trails plan is not going to be able to answer and resolve all these issues, but but there should be some ongoing discussions and these recommendations can kind of help inform a longer term interagency work program to, to make our trail system safer and um, uh, inviting for everyone in the community. One of the things that uh, we might be able to do is like we do with the highways is uh, adopt a, a adopt a trail type deal, mm -hmm. reach out to organizations, at least they can go out during this time of the year and get the leaves off the road, make it a little bit safer. Just an idea. Great. Um, thanks. Let's see. Let's go on to our next um, agenda item, which is the federal legislative update. So this will be fairly quick. I'll take the federal and Karen will take the state and um, we're a little off. So I'm going to go through this quickly. There hasn't been a whole lot of change since we talked last month, but each each month we're going to provide an update to you on on what's going on with um, federal funding in particular, because uh, it's going to be very pertinent to us. And so the little bit more information we've got since the last meeting is Right now, the folks at the Federal Highway Administration and Federal Transit Administration and a, a number of other federal agencies, they're all working on the, uh, the apportionment to the state. So um, based on the existing formulas for distributing money to the states, how much funding does each state get? Um, there's rough numbers for that, but now they're really working on w w the 2022 apportionment to the states. And we've heard from our local programs uh, folks at WashDOT that we probably won't have information on uh, any increases that, that are coming until um, January at the earliest. Um, and we've been told that for the surface transportation block grant funds, that that for planning purposes, we can we can plan on a two to ten percent increase on that that surface transportation block grant funds. But that is a very rough estimate um, before they've really done any of the the real work in figuring out where the funds are going to go. Um, and those are just the funding. That's the funding that's going to be distributed based on formula. And then once the funds come to the state, there'll be a whole another process within the state of how do we then distribute those funds um, to the to locals to regions, what the state uh, keeps and and so there's there's still a lot of work to be done uh, to get these federal infrastructure funds out. Um, we've been told to and and that's just for the like I said the formula funds, a lot of this funding is going to be in grant programs. A lot of existing grant programs, but also new grant programs. And we've been told to expect that for those existing grant programs, it'll be probably at least six months before these new funds really start getting out in these new grant programs. And it could be up to a year for those, those things that require new programs to be developed before the funding can go out. We'll keep tracking this extremely closely. Um, there's still more questions than answers at this point. Great. Um, any quick questions? Uh, I just got a message from Karen just so that we can um, take a look at the state legislative update in that, um, in this out, at the end so we have enough time to talk about the um, autonomous vehicle. So let, I agree with her on that. Let's, let's go sh straight to that and um, see that presentation, Mark. Share my screen, which you should now be seeing my presentation. Is that right? Gotcha. Yep. Good. Yeah. All right. So I'm excited to bring this one to this group because, um, and I'm glad that John O'Callaghan in particular is here today because you're going to like this. Um, we've, we, I, I, I presented this to council um, the month before last uh, and it, 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 there was quite a bit of interest. And so I wanted to make sure to also bring the same presentation to policy board. 
Uh, it's been a council and a policy board priority for some time now to really stay on top of what the state is doing and therefore what we should be doing as a region uh, to prepare for automated technologies. And at their October meeting, the Washington State Transportation Commission focused the entire two, well, one and a half day meeting on really the future of logistics and the future of automated technologies in transportation. And there was a lot of really interesting. So I'm gonna go through um, a day and a half worth of, uh, of information in a very short period of time, um, TVW, covered the whole thing. And so if you want to dig into any more detail on this, you can watch the entire um, meeting um, on TVW. So this was, they did, the commission did this in partnership with uh, ACES and Pacific Northwest Economic Region. I'm going to bring up ACES because if you haven't heard about this, this is a group you'll, you'll continue to hear about. Um, it's, it ACES stands for the the oh where are my notes uh, sorry um, automated connected electric and shared vehicle technologies uh, is what ACES is and they're a conglomeration of of um, Northwest businesses that are really working to bring automated technologies to to our area and this was an update on all things logistic and automation and so they started with. Uh, they had one of the, the commissioners from the Northwest Seaport Alliance. That is the um, partnership of uh, Port of Tacoma and Port of Seattle and talking about the uh, supply chain issues. And I think many of us have, have heard what kind of what's behind that at this point, but I, I liked this, the, this summary and it, and it kind of struck me in a way I hadn't thought of before. And, and what they were talking about was how when the pandemic started in early 2020 and factories closed all around the, the globe, at least temporarily, all that really put our cargo ships um, kind of out of whack because our system is meant to be a ongoing fluid system where these ships don't spend a lot of time docked. And so there actually wasn't enough room around the globe for all these ships to dock uh, because they didn't have any place to go for that period of time when everything was shut down. And so that got all of our ships and also importantly, all of our cargo containers out of place around the globe. And it has taken a long time as things have ramped back up to get the ships, get the cargo containers back where they need to be so that the system can work um, how it's meant to, which is just this constant loop of ships coming in and out and containers moving to and from the places they need to be. That was compounded by, we already had a truck driver shortage going into the pandemic. Um, it's estimated that we've lost over 100,000 um, more truck drivers since the pandemic uh, nationwide. 70% of the freight that goes through ports ends up on a truck at some point in time. And so this shortage has really just increased the, the strain on the system, the shortage of drivers. And we, we know that we saw a big increase in consumer demand over the pandemic as more folks were um, shopping from home. And so a lot more strain on the system to deliver those goods. And so even with the supply chain issues, Cargo volumes are up uh, at both Tacoma and Seattle, up over 18% over 2020. Um, and they are operating currently at capacity. And so um, where we are at right now in terms of supply chain is where we're going to be for a little while until things kind of renormalize um, as they get all the ships and everything back where they're, they're supposed to be. So truck transport. Oh, John O'Callaghan. Oh, John. Yeah. Uh, did they talk about some of the government regulations? For example, uh, one of the major sticking points down in California, the California parts are if uh, if your truck is over three years old, you cannot go into the port. That puts a major that puts a major strain on no matter what you're doing. Did, they, they, did, that, they did. did that come they, up? They, it, it did not come up. Okay. 
Okay. Um, truck transport. So then, so we just talked about uh, an issue with having adequate um, drivers to move the goods that we have coming into our ports and other places. Packar was there and they are a, a company based in Bellevue uh, working on tractor trailers. And their, their main emphasis right now is developing a um, reliable with adequate range electric uh, big trailer truck. So the class eight, the biggest of the, the trucks is what they are working to develop an uh, alternative fuel vehicle. And they, they have them um, and they've been testing them. They've been testing them in LA at the port of Los Angeles. Um, right now they're, they're experiencing a range of about 170 miles for the electric version and about 350 miles for the hydrogen uh, version of their truck. The drivers have really uh, liked the vehicles. Um, folks who've driven electric vehicles, power is not really a, an issue. In fact, they feel pretty darn zippy. And that's the same thing that, that truck drivers have, have been reporting as well. The, the good power and handling, there are lower maintenance costs because there are just less things to break on an electric um, motor. But as we've talked about in this meeting on a number of occasions, we don't have the, um, the, the mechanic infrastructure, the maintenance infrastructure for these electric vehicles. And so there is a big need for training and an inflow of people that are able to work on these electric vehicles. So one of the things with this driver shortage, uh, platooning vehicles has become a, a, a even bigger area of conversation. We've talked about this before um, and, and talked about how platooning trucks might be one of our early um, entries into automated vehicles. And I, and I think that's still the case. PACCAR is working uh, really closely with a company called Aurora. And Aurora, is their, their focus is that driverless technology. And right now they've, they've got a partnership, PACCAR, Aurora, and FedEx, and they have some autonomous um, smaller freight vehicles that they're currently piloting in various areas uh, to, to, to deliver freight. And so this, these are pilots that are already um, in motion. One thing that was really interesting here is with some of the, some of the, accidents and some of people's user experiences with some of these technologies, um, public sentiment around automation is not as strong as it was before. There's more, um, there's more caution and skepticism about the safety of automated vehicles than there, there was before. And so with that, uh, what we heard is that the, the industry is shifting a little more to um, looking at where can this kind of technology have the greatest impact? Freight is a big one. And then that mobility as a service, so like your Ubers and your Lyfts, uh, tr uh, trying to get those to be the first adopters of automated uh, technologies. Because if the thought there is one, that's a, those are huge use cases. And two, if people can start to see those and get comfortable with the way that those operate, that could help um, usher in uh, more of the, the individual consumer use of these automated technologies. Um, they've also, they're finding, not surprisingly, they work a lot better on the highway. Um, they work a lot better in less dense areas where there are just um, fewer uh, obstacles, fewer issues that the um, technology needs to identify. And in a platoon situation, it's actually a relatively lower level of automation because the way that they're testing it at this point and planning to, to implement it is um, at very least the first truck has a driver and the driver is in control at all time. He might be assisted by, by the technology or she, but um, they are in control of, of the vehicle. But the trailing vehicles, two or three trailing vehicles, would be playing follow the leader, essentially. They may or may not have a driver, and they would be using their technology to follow the lead truck. They follow with shorter distances in between. 
which uh, greatly increases their fuel efficiency, reduces their emissions, and reduces their the room that these trucks take up on the, the freeway. So it increases that, that capacity to some extent. Another thing they talked about, and this was really interesting, last mile freight. And University of Washington had, had two pilots that they've been doing over the last couple of years. And uh, one of them was with uh, lockers for deliveries. And that's what you see in this upper left here is they tested these lockers that would be out in front of apartment buildings. Um, and the delivery driver goes and puts the package in, in the locker and each resident has a code that they use to access their deliveries. And what they found with this, with the drivers, delivery drivers just needing to go to these lockers, they saved 50% of the time that they had been spending in the buildings. And overall, they're reducing their, their time at that delivery point by 33%. So reducing that time at the curb. And as we've talked about before, increasingly that time at the curb is the big limiting factor. We, need, we wanna get those vehicles in and out as quickly as possible. They also did a pilot with um, uh, electric uh, cargo bikes, and this was in the Seattle area. And what they found with the, these e-bikes is they were able to reduce the vehicle miles traveled by half, uh, they reducing the tailpipe emissions by 30%. And then one of the things that was a little bit unexpected is because these bikes, uh, especially in Seattle now, they have um, improved bicycle lane infrastructure. And so these bikes could actually move through the city more efficiently than a vehicle could. And they don't have to find parking um, because they can go up on the sidewalk while they are making their, their delivery. And so they found that uh, seven of these cargo e-bikes could replace 10 box trucks. So significant, um, cost savings and obviously emissions and better for the transportation system. So a lot of promising um, findings in that study. They've talked about technology and agriculture. And I bring this one up because this one was a bit eye-opening for me from a data perspective. And what they were talking about is how, how prominent technology is on the modern farm. And things like what you're seeing here in, in this photo, this is a drone that flies over the fields. It identifies weed from crop, sends this little guy out into the, the field and he's solar powered, has a little bit of whatever they're using to treat weeds and pests and delivers a micro dose uh, directly to the, the weed or pest and much more efficiently, much easier on, on the land um, can help to address those issues. They also have, all, they're already using a lot of different fully automated harvesting uh, uh, technologies. And what the studies have found is that farms that that just use one of these advanced technologies dramatically increase their yield. Um, they're, they're, they're cutting their costs. It's safer for their farm workers. And we're also having a shortage of farm workers. So this helps to deal with that. One of the downsides or one of the challenges they're seeing is these things are incredibly data intensive. And so the, the modern farm has a need for high speed, internet so that they can communicate to their equipment and so that they can manage these very, very um, high levels of data that are just becoming more and more of the norm for, for the modern farm. And they talked about um, flying cars. And this one was really interesting because they had um, folks from Hind uh, Hyundai there and this is what Hyundai's working on in a, in a number of different states. And this was really interesting. And I, I was trying to think of how can I, how can I summarize this down? And, and this is um, really what they see as how you would access this kind of transportation in the future. So if, if they fully realize their concept, then when you're looking to go somewhere, 
you're going to you're going to book a trip using your phone or your computer it's going to find you the most efficient route get you synced up with other passengers it might send a automated a, a little vehicle to come pick you up wherever you are at on that little automated vehicle you could do things like identify I, I, uh, identify the, the person, any health screening that might need to take place, and then it delivers you to the hub where the where the flying vehicles are. They are working on um, a, a technology that looks similar to what we've seen, just big versions of the drones that we see using using a rotor technology. Um, so smooth vertical takeoff and and put down so that you fly to your location doing whatever you want on the way you arrive at the next little heliport and then there might be some automated vehicles that that take you to your final destination this is what they're going for so not not people having um flying vehicles but more like a urban um a series of urban airports for for these these types of vehicles and that's what that's New what kind of city transit for. Yeah, I just saw a big present. I just saw a big presentation on this as well. The company down in Austin, Texas, oh, Austin, Texas, and it's this same thing. It's a it's a drone, uh, and then you don't need the. Uh, but it's actually um, it can be automated, or you can drive the drone yourself, and you don't need a pilot's license. You just need a couple hours worth of training, and you can basically go. Uh, these 10 mile trips into, on, on these hubs as well. So they're gonna be their automated component where you can drive it your, yourself. And uh, they're expecting that like the, a trip cost to be like $12 when it's, when it's totally done. And, they're, and they think that they really believe that this will be here. This will be how a lot of the, in their dense urban areas um, where this is more, <laughs> more efficient um, that this will be available in 20, like everyone will be using these 20 years from now. So like that, be, I mean, yeah, this is not, this is not science fiction. This is what they are actively working to put in place. And, and, and as you say, chair, just one example, this is what Hyundai is doing. Yeah. Um, what, one last piece on this, cause it was one, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, it, this was a pretty important um, development at this meeting. One of the things that they've been talking about for a few years now. So it, it, as part of the group that, that, um, that I've been participating on with the state looking at, at automation, there was another group that was meeting and talking about the potential for a state pilot, so a state-funded pilot. And at this October meeting, the commission did unanimous, unanimously um, vote to direct staff to, to create a proposal for um, the commission to consider and what that proposal would do, they'd then give that to the legislature and essentially the legislature with some amount of funding would direct the transportation commission and WashDOT to develop a pilot automated transportation um, solicitation for the 2023 legislature. And so uh, what this means is, so they looked at examples. And so for Utah, Utah wanted to uh, expand uh, autonomous um, technologies in their area. They had a very specific use case. They wanted them for hospitals, schools, and such. And so they wrote a very specific RFP and looked for firms that could provide that kind of service automated in, in Utah. Minnesota had a pilot where instead they defined the objectives that they wanted to, to test and to meet in their pilot and asked for firms to say, what kinds of uh, automated technologies would you propose putting in place to meet those objectives? In Washington, the, the commission said, let's look for a hybrid of those. Let's not be as prescriptive as, prescriptive as Utah, but let's not be as open-ended as Minnesota. And so that's what um, staff is now at the Transportation Commission is working on to bring back to the commission for consideration. So it's possible that as early as 2023, um, our state would go out with an RFP uh, to for uh, companies to come bring uh, automated technologies as a pilot somewhere in the state. So that's a significant change uh, or a significant advancement since uh, since what they've been talking about before. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen.
and I didn't help us gain a whole lot of time. My apologies for that. But any questions? I got to find my Zoom first um, so I can stop sharing my screen. I think I see Don Melnick's hands first. So I'll let you go. Yeah. Well, a couple of questions. Number one, um, you didn't really cover the why. Why this in suddenly in motivation? Maybe it seems obvious, but that is a question. The other yeah, one the, is pretty, oh, I'm sorry. You mean why, why for the state in terms of? No, the general pressure in this country to begin to look at this. What is? Oh, well, this has been this has been building for some time. They, they've the the state had convened this series of of different groups working on automated transportation, um, probably three years ago now. And really, the the main driver is these technologies are being developed. These technologies will be deployed. Um, and so the sooner that we as local regions, state, feds, really figure out how we want to see these technologies um, deployed in our, in, in our areas, that's, that's the sense of urgency is these things are coming, let's be ready. Thank you. And the other thing, based on, I've often listened to my favorite Stanford Uni University futurist, Tony Seba, who talks about how some of this may materialize and, and almost eliminating the need for parking lots and maybe even some public highways. Uh, and I wonder if that has begun and uh, if that factor is beginning to be contemplated by this forum that you're part of, Mark. Yep, it's one of the things that's being discussed and more and more you start, or you're starting to hear it come up in conversations of, of new buildings and new developments is do we need the same amount of parking that we, that we had, you know, 20 years ago, things are different. So I think those kind of conversations are only going to increase. And then the last thing was just about sustainability. I mean, obviously, if we, if this facilitates a greater movement towards electric vehicles, arguably, it has, will have a significant effect on arguably climate change in the end. I wondered if that is, is a factor that's being contemplated to hope. It is, so. and because, it, and it could be beneficial because it, Virtually all of the companies that are working on automated transportation are working on an electric vehicle platform. Um, that is just the expectation of that's the future of vehicles. And so I haven't heard of any company that's not working on an electric vehicle platform. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting John. presentation. Okay. Uh, has anybody come up with an, an actual timeline um, when this is all going to start taking effect? And the reason that I ask that is because people that are my age uh, aren't going to be very accepting of this. They're going to be afraid of getting into a vehicle that they have no control over uh, or, or a human has no control over. So is there a phase in and phase out plan? For example, uh, Andy, he's already been in the, these type of vehicles and he thinks they're great. I think they're great. They're just cool, flat out cool. But there's that, there is that, that giant phase that we've got to go through a generational gap before all of this stuff really becomes fully effective. Has any of that been brought up? Absolutely. And in fact, I think that's one of the things that is being talked about the most. And when I t said that, that folks are a little less bullish on automation than, than they were five years ago, I mean, that is, that's one of the issues is that, is that people that haven't experienced the technologies are wary of them and we have heard of more instances where there have been accidents. And so uh, to answer your first question about timelines, you used to see a lot of timelines and people would say by 2040, we can expect this. I, I, I'm not seeing that as much in the literature. This is coming, but I'm not seeing as many of those predictions uh, in terms of when we will all be doing these things. Okay. So from someone who drives an autonomous vehicle, and I'm also on the, I've been accepted for the beta version of the in-town autonomous, um, it's, it's, you're, you're right. On the freeway, it works really well. It works really well. The only time it has problems is if you have um, the traffic kind of slows in front of you, your, my Tesla will automatically change lanes. <laughs> and so I, I just have my, 
you know, hand on, I have to have my, my hand on the wheel, but if you're in kind of slower traffic um, and, and it'll go around the vehicle and then, you know, and then it keeps, it keeps doing this weaving part. And it, it's like, at some point I feel like I need to, I need to turn it off and just have, do the regular assisted because it keeps changing lanes all the time. And that's when it, it's kind of off. The other thing is, is it'll, it'll go until you get down to um, off, it'll, it'll turn off the, um, onto the inner, you know, uh, on, off the freeway, and then it turns off and you have to turn it back on again. Um, and through town, it's, it's okay if you're just basically going in straight lines. Like I can, I can turn it on and go downtown Olympia, pretty much a straight shot. Um, and it's, it's, it's okay. What it's unable to do is go through you, uh, roundabouts. It'll, it'll, just, it'll go up to the roundabout and it just, it'll, it turns off because it, understandably so, it can't, it doesn't have cameras to look that, those directions. And so it doesn't know if a car is coming and, and, or what to do around the roundabout. So if the technology is not quite there yet for, for roundabouts, the other thing that is when you're going through town, um, if there's cars parked, say, alongside the road, that may, you know, that is typical for that, but it, 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 it comes by really close, you know, on cars parked alongside side of the road. And that's when it gets a little scary. So that it's, it's, it's really neat. It's really cool. Um, and I probably use it more than that. The average person uses it because the more you use it, the, the more, more data it collects and the smarter it gets. And so I try to use it all, <laughs> all the time as much as I possibly can. Um, but it, it's, and it's, it's, it's neat, but it's not quite there yet. You know, it's, it's, still has a little ways to go before you can get into the car and, and, and put in a, you know, you have to put in an address and it'll follow the address, but it's, uh, it'll stop at stop signs and turn. You have to, um, if you're like taking a right or taking a left or going straight, you have to, uh, tap, tap it with your, the gas though, um, to say that you can go. Um, so there's, it's not doing it all on its on on its own quite yet. You still have to uh, put in signals and stuff like that, but it's getting close. We're a lot closer than uh, I thought we would be at, at this stage of the game. But um, the the one thing that we need to start thinking about though is you know uh, when it comes to freight and they're really pushing this as as yeah. Mark said as as much as they can because there's a huge driver shortage. They've seen the the return on that investment. And so thinking about that, boy, we should probably have some big electric charging stations for these semis, you know, maybe out in Northeast Lacey where there's all that, we start to think about planning for, for the future because the future is, is here. <laughs> and and if, but if they don't have a charging station near the, you know, these outlets where, uh, you, know, uh, you know, they're gonna be, they're gonna be in trouble as well, so. Uh, there's some some work to do and will be interesting in this transportation package if it's if those things are specifically addressed and andy to be fair many human drivers don't know what to do at a roundabout either <laughs> right that's true that's true and, and it's it's amazing it'll, if there's someone jumps out in front of you they'll, they'll slam on the they'll turn on the brakes it's it's really um smarter than you know than yeah, you are the problem i start getting to is i start not paying attention as much because I get I fall into this lull of just letting it drive and I'm not paying attention and that's not good either because it's not you're not quite there yet uh, to not be fully paying attention. I, I do think when John's point about uh, giving up control of the vehicle is an issue but I think at least as I age I realize there's going to be a time when I'm not going to be capable of driving and yeah. if, it, if, the, if the autonomous system is that transportation to service becomes available. If I'm alive then, I, I would want to use it simply because I'm able to get me someplace that I cannot otherwise get to. Yeah, that's a good point. Chair, sure, I'm, I'm noting that we're at time and-, and Okay, this, okay. is there anyone else besides John who want to chime, on, chime in on this? Okay, one last thing, John. Uh, one of the things about the, about charging these vehicles 
is if you're just tapping into the current, uh, the, the current electrical grid, we're going to run out of power real quick. I think what needs to happen, especially at some of these stations, is that we figure out how to build generators so that that's what's generating the, the electricity for that area instead of just tapping into power lines that are underground or above head. Otherwise, we're going to run out of power. Now, that is one thing that they said is our, our grid's not quite ready yep. <laughs> either. Uh, yep. We yeah. you know that's a lot more electricity is going to be powering vehicles and everything else if we're getting, you know, and so we're not quite, we need to do some major up, upgrades to our grid. That's that's for sure. Okay, um, let's go on to the, the next agenda item, which is our outgoing member recognition. And yep. I know we have several today. I just want to, um, talk about one other that I was just notified. Um, Graham Sackerson has, has let us know that he's not going to be running for another term. And so his term will be up uh, next month. And so we're gonna be uh, losing Graham, um, you know, after next January. And so I just, that's sad we're, we're losing so, so, so much uh, knowledge here. We, we hope, Pete, that you stay on somehow as a, our community rep or whatever you want to do, but, you know, we've, we're losing a lot of expertise from this Transportation Policy Board, but given that, I'll, I'll turn it over to, to Mark. And yeah, thank you all for, for hanging with us for a couple more minutes, because I, I, I think it's so important um, to say thank you to people that have served. And um, I'm, from a staff perspective, we appreciate what council, what policy board, the effort that you all put into these meetings and the insight. I mean, look at the conversation we just had. That's why we're successful. And that's why we're successful together. And we, John, I'm going to talk first about John Winans. We got a chance to say uh, thank you to John a little bit at council because um, he, he presented at council this last last meeting. But John's been with us as the uh, on TPB as the Olympic Region Administrator since 2016, and uh, so just a little bit before me, and one of, he was one of the first people that I met with, and we had an excellent relationship from the start. And I so appreciate John's approach because he's always we've had this mutual understanding. Our organizations are not always going to be able to agree. We're not always going to be able to be on the exact same page, but there's no reason we shouldn't be communicating clearly about those positions, understanding where we agree, understanding where we we can't at this point, and 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 work through it. And he 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 meant it when he said it, and he's lived it throughout my entire time being here. He's such an excellent partner. I hear from other MPOs and RTPO directors around the state of of tensions at times with WashDOT. Uh, we don't experience that with Olympic Region, and um, John's leadership is a big part of that. Um, so, John, on behalf of, of staff, on behalf of TRPC, I just want to thank you for your years of service. You have been such an excellent partner, and we're going we're gonna to miss you. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. And I, I know we're out of time, but I have, you know, I've been engaged with this group before I was an RA as well for many years, and I've always been so impressed at the engagement, the professionalism, the passion that you all show for the work that you do. It's it's just, it's, it's a mo it should be a model for, for many groups. So, you know, congratulations on that. And thank you for my time here. My replacement is a gentleman named Steve Rourke. Many of you know Steve. He's been a longtime region employee. He spent a few years at headquarters. He's back. He's amazing. Um, you know what? I hate to say it, but in a couple of months, you won't even miss me. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, John. Enjoy your retirement. It's well-deserved. Thank you. <laughs> So uh, the next one, this is this is a hard one to, to say goodbye to, and uh, Chair Ryder has has already brought this up. Is uh, this this is our 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 final meeting as as mayor for Mayor Pete Komet, and he's been on a transportation policy board since 2000. So 21 years his his service is is legal uh, in the state. Um, and including a number of years as TPB chair, and I, you all know this. I don't. I, I, I'm not sure if there's anyone that digs into the details. 
reads, mm -hmm. is as thoughtful, um, has such a keen eye, impeccable memory, um, and is truly guided by what's best for mm -hmm. the residents of Tumwater, and importantly to this body, what's best for the residents of the Thurston region. He truly lives public service. And I feel so lucky to have had the chance to work with Mayor Kmet over uh, my time here. And uh, I see my internet is unstable. So I will sum it up to say thank you, Pete, very, very much. We will miss you at this table, Mayor Komet. And I know you won't be a stranger and you will keep us honest on many things, trails among them. <laughs> well, thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. And it's been, this is, you know, I, I've always enjoyed being on this committee. I actually go back to 96. I looked at my, my uh, record. It's, it's amazing how long it's been, but I became, a, uh, uh, I guess, uh, I drank the Kool-Aid back in the late 90s when I saw some of the transportation modeling that was done that indicated that we kept going where we were going. Tumwater, uh, you know, Capitol Boulevard and Tumwater would end up being seven lanes wide and essentially wipe out what was left of, of uh, down, so-called downtown Tumwater. And our rural streets, our roads would have ended up being five lane, five lanes wide at that. So we, you know, that was when we said, hey, we got to do something different. We started looking at how can we increase our density, urban densities. Uh, we've never really taken on the issue of rural, rural development outside of our urban growth area. And that, I think that's one of our biggest challenges as a county. Uh, but um I, you know, I think we've made tremendous progress uh, as a as a as a region, and it's I really enjoyed and learned a lot. You, just some tremendous staff here at Re Regional Planning Council, uh, and uh, have really educated me on the issues. So, thank you all for for all of the support you've given me over the years too. Well, thank you, Pete, and I'm going to uh, remind you that you know we do have a community rep <laughs> coming open. And we would love for you to uh, you know, apply for that, or you obviously qualify for the um, the the, uh, the other representation, the other emeritus, position. yeah, emeritus position. But you know, since community rep is is open, you're you qualify for that. And I know you you deserve your retirement, you know. And I you know, I wish you all the best, and I look forward to uh, next week to uh, your your celebration um, as well. But uh, we we hope you stick around and, and at least. Think about staying on, on on the policy board if not next year you know it's, it's sometime soon thank you andy uh, is is that it mark is just the two I, i'll note that uh tracy wood is also yes. this is would be tracy wood's last um uh meeting as as well yeah i was gonna mention that but it doesn't look like tracy came on so Okay, well, um, Karen, you, you just want to talk real quick. Yeah, we're going to you have some outside, um, or we're going to do the state legislative stuff. What do you want? I'll to just do? do it. I'll just do it all in the um, after meeting summary. Okay. And we'll, well, we'll all clap a little bit. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you, Pete. Um, well, you know, don't be strangers. Hopefully see you, see you again sometime soon, but enjoy your retirements. Front. Um, and with that, we've reached the end of our agenda. So uh, objection, I'll call this meeting adjourned. Not see everyone. Motion. <laughs> Thank you Good all. Not everybody. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.